I mean, the and one stuff I could talk about for hours. So but. I know it's um, it's such a nostalgic part of my life. Like yeah. and one built me. Like that's what I was out there trying to do yeah. the the moves the that moves. they were doing, not what I I didn't watch the NBA like that yeah. for me, right? And um, so it built me my style, how I play. And but think about that though. And then I had, but the cool thing was I had good coaching. Yeah. In my my AAU situations where I was learning the fundamental side. Mm-hmm. It didn't come together until probably after college, though, where mm-hmm. I was like, how to use these, Those, this skill set within yeah. a fundamental setting, which is now what the NBA is, right? It started early, like you said, the Tim Hardaway's, like that style and all that really building up. I think AI was that moment hip-hop met basketball at the NBA mm-hmm. where he crossed Jordan, like, hey, this is going to work. He brought hip-hop. And, yep. And then, you know now it is what it is today but it's so dope to hear the ground level of like you said he uh uh black widow is saying oh, i want to play real basketball yeah like that's not real basketball yeah it is it <laughs> it's is. hoop it's, it's it actually is. the authentic version of basketball if it you really is. want to talk about it yeah and so how do we teach the kids about the history of basketball and also teach them how to reach their dreams with it now you know, now that everything's so, as soon as they find something hot, they try to commercialize it. Nothing's built organically for a long period of time like it used to mm-hmm. because of the cameras, the social media. The money. Yeah. It's, it's, it's quick money. It's, we live in a microwave society right now, and that's been going on for a while, where um, people want instant gratification. And to be an elite basketball player, it doesn't come like that. There's a lot of time, there's a lot of effort, there's a lot of boring work. And that's what being a developer is all about. Mm-hmm. I have kids that don't like the way I train because they're like, man, we've been doing the same move for 15 mm-hmm. minutes. I'm like, yeah, you still ain't made it. You still ain't <laughs> did it right. You still can't shoot, you know? And I have parents, I have fun with this. If a parent comes to me and like, I welcome critique of um, my program, whatever I'm doing. But there's only a certain level. You can only go so far because I'll tell you in a heartbeat, listen, don't I don't come to your job telling you how to make French Man. fries. So don't come to my job telling me how to teach. Yes. And they'll be like, oh. I'll be like, yeah. My, I say it a little different. I don't mention French fries, assuming they work at McDonald's. I say, that's <laughs> what I, say. I get disrespectful I, I, with it. I set them up. I say, hey, what do you do for a living? Oh, yeah, I'm a financial analyst. I'm like, okay, so... I'm going to come to your job and let you know how to yeah, do these numbers. Exactly. Um, would you let me do that? Yes. No. So why are you telling me how to do basketball? This is what I do. I know mm-hmm. you watch it and you think you're, you are you know what basketball is, but this is what I actually do. Most of those parents never played <laughs> high school or college basketball. Yeah. So the assumption that they know what they're doing is it's kind of crazy. And I deal with that on a regular basis on every level. Um, with young kids coming up with a lot of these situations. And what happens, unfortunately, is if a parent does too much early on and their child does go pro, when he goes pro and he starts to find out how things actually should be done, they cut those parents off yeah. from those situations. Yeah. They're like, no, 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 this is my money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You can't tell me what to do with my money. You can't tell me how to run my life because I'm a man and I'm making this money and I am now the you know patriarch of the family. I'm going to help support the family and so forth. And that's cool. So there are ways to be involved in your kid's life um, from a business standpoint, from a, yes. from a development standpoint, push them in the right direction and still keep that father-son, mother-son relationship alive, yeah. you know, but it's a very thin line that you can't cross and it's difficult. And if you don't have anyone in your corner that you trust that will tell you this and you believe them, a lot of times you are somewhat cut off from those situations. It's unfortunate, but that's just a reality of it. There are very few parents that are involved in the business side of an NBA player's life. Very few. I don't know of five, Mm. you know, and if there are five, kudos to them because they did something that's damn near impossible because you're talking about 450 of the best players in the world Mm -hmm. and 
for your child to make it there and for you to be involved in the business. Maybe you were involved in that sports field before. What is your experience in that sport field? And you were able to have it translate to your child and he gets it and he doesn't look at you as overbearing or whatever. So it's yeah. difficult. It's a difficult line, you know. And um, these parents nowadays, there's no real guidance. There's no book. There's no Bible so, on basketball. There is now. So let me talk to you about You're writing stuff. it? I am. Okay. And so literally, this is why I started this podcast. It's because parents don't have information. And so my goal is to bring the professionals who've done this for a long time, are doing this now, who the guys who were in the NBA, um, to give that information to parents. Mm -hmm. I have, I'm developing a personal development program for families of, hey, here's the blueprint. This is what it's supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. This is what your inner circle looks like. These are the people you're supposed to always listen to. Here's your brain trust. Here's the people who help develop your game. This is what to expect when you get to high school. This is how you choose an AAU team. This is what you should look at when you go to college. This is what you should look at when you get to an agency. What, what is NIL? How much money can I really make? Which NIL should I do? Literally developing a book right now and that program so parents can have a, just a blueprint. And so, because it's missing, I, I do, I've been doing it now because of all my middle schoolers who've mm -hmm. developed into pros, mm -hmm. right, or going yeah. to college, right? It's like, they come back and ask me all these questions. And so, if I didn't know the answer, I'm, ca I'm calling, hey, Mark, how, how do I get to this part? Mm -hmm. Hey, so-and-so, agent, how, Rich Paul, hey, yo, a kid is going through this. What's the best way to go? Mm -hmm. And college coach, hey, should this kid do this thing? So I've been able to collect the information to give them at least the blueprints, a skeleton. It's not perfect. It's not mm -hmm. for, it's not built for everybody. Let me say that different. It's built for everybody to make you. You have to personalize it. Once yes. you get that skeleton, you have to personalize it. That, and that's, that's the part I'm working on. I yeah. have the skeleton. I have the information down. And so I'm trying to connect it to the stories and the people who have gone through it. Right. right? And so there hopefully you know by the end of this year that book will be here to so parents can have just a, a light blueprint of this is how you do it and then if basketball doesn't work out can you stay with basketball can you develop help develop an n1 mixtape tour and uh manage athletes and uh consult for movies it's a difficult and, conversation it's a difficult conversation mm -hmm. to tell a player who's playing college basketball that you're not a pro but you should go pro in something else. I have a, a young man that I've been around his entire life right now. His name is uh, Brandon Robinson. And Brandon is a kid that is crazy because um, the neighborhood I lived in, uh, a kid that lived two doors down from me was a kid named Ryan Harrow. He actually went to Kentucky, NC State or whatever, Georgia State. Got a championship ring at Kentucky. And then around the corner, Brandon Robinson, who ended up going to North Carolina, get a championship ring in North Carolina. And um, when Brandon, after his senior year, we hit COVID. So we're working out. He's trying to go overseas, trying to get, um, you know, free agent look or whatever. And the workouts are going great. I mean, we've got his vertical to about 41 inches, shooting the ball at, a, at an amazing clip. He's 6'5" you know, handles the ball well, coaches son, really smart, Carol Carolina, you know, that's, right. that's a great lineage. And I'm like, man, this ain't you. Mm. You should go into coaching. You should go, you should do like grad assistant, you know, figure it out. And he was like, that was a tough conversation. Yeah. But the fact that I've been mentoring him for so long, almost his whole life, he took it and understood that I wasn't coming at him with any kind of malice. I was coming at him with logic. Like, bro, it is so hard to be one of the talented 450. But your father was a coach. You have a, an amazing IQ. And I've been training for so long that you understand development. Mm -hmm. Not training, development. Yeah. Because you've developed. And he was like, damn, man, you right. So he went on to be a grad assistant, and the first year he was there as a grad assistant, he was training and developing the guys on the team, working with them as much as he could. They made it to the championship, and that was when they lost the championship just recently. 
you know. Um, he went back to North Carolina. He went back to North Carolina. Man. Yeah. And from there, the next year, got a job working with Charlotte. So spent the year there, learning this system, video, consultant, whatever. So now he's in Utah. You know what I'm saying? And I'm talking to him, and we're like, within the next five years, you will could possibly be a head coach. Man. Making five, six, seven, eight million dollars a year, ten million a year. Man. That's a so now, guess what? You're still in the NBA. Man. But guess what? He still suits up and plays with the guys. Mm-hmm. Definitely destroys his co-workers. <laughs> he still has a he still has a ratchet. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Still dunking. He's he's still young. He's 24, 25, just Yes, and he's man. in the he's in the NBA. Yeah. You know, still on the cool side of things. He still is in line for being able to work in the NBA for 30 years. Yeah. Making millions of dollars. That's cool, yes. ain't it? 100%. You're at the games. You're well-dressed. You're flying on a private jet. You got per diem. You're staying in five-star hotels. You got security around you. you in he's, the NBA. Not, he's not one of the 450, but he's part of the league. No, you're in the NBA. That's so for sure. how many kids are willing to go that route? How many, will, how many kids are willing to say, you know what? I've been doing a lot of push-ups and jumping jacks and <laughs> toe raises, and I still can't jump like this dude right here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Maybe I'll take another route that keeps me around this thing. So speaking into that, I, I think the biggest impact, like you're saying, is the, the parent information, the AAU scene and how parents behave in the AAU scene and how do they um, how do they navigate it? What's the best advice you can give them? Here, let's talk about this. What's the problem and what's your solution to it? Wow. Uh, the problem we have is, I think the biggest problem is USA Basketball. Mm. Yeah, I think the biggest problem is USA Basketball because USA Basketball they have the opportunity to say, you know what? Let me take over this entire thing. Hmm. Let me get everybody under one umbrella. Let me let y'all have y'all leagues. But then guess what I can do? Let me get your best this many teams, your best this many teams, your best this many teams. Let me do a big tournament. Let me take this over. Let me incorporate the NBA which gives it so much more validity, so yes. much more power, because why would you not want to be where NBA scouts are going to be? Yes. And it's still under the USA Basketball umbrella a true of development. A true governing body. That's right. We need one true governing body, you know. And they're the problem because I don't think they have the moxie to say, this is what we're going to do, and you're going to, do this because the kids will be like, I want to go over there. Because if, if 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 they said NBA scouts, you guys have you're gonna come to this. The, the Nike teams, the Under Armour teams, yeah, they're gonna be like, yeah, well, we'll okay, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll go around that. And I'm not saying to take anything from Nike, Adidas, or Under Armour. Still do your thing because you want to have. You have to think about this. Why aren't there any basketball commercials anymore? Remember when LeBron had the LeBrons? Oh, you man. remember when he was the Penny old man and your kid and all yeah, that. you remember the Penny Hardaway Little commercials, Penny doll, yep. the Michael Jordan commercials, and those commercials sold sneakers. You know why they don't have those commercials anymore? Because we don't have to. All I have to do is put the sneakers on the best local basketball players in every region, and you're gonna buy. <laughs> That's facts. Those kids are being, damn, I'm not going to say the word, but they're being used to market these shoes. So I'm going to give a basketball Mark, team. I think you have to say the word. <laughs> I have, because well, well, I have friends in all of those, so I want to upset anyone. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to be respectful for okay. what they do and not, I don't want to be disrespectful what anybody does for a living, you know? Um, well, I don't think it's those people because those are your friends, right? And you know their heart is to give those kids opportunity, put yeah. money in their pockets. But the and, brands, I think it's the brands yes. that don't really understand that 
it, it could come off as if you're pimping kids. Yeah. It could come off as that. There we go. But I know the people who have to follow those instructions and and do their job, they do an amazing job and, yes. and not to disparage them. I just think they don't I, I just don't think sometimes people understand our culture in totality. Mm-hmm. We still want that we still want that 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 entertainment. The last person to do commercials was Kyrie. And Kyrie didn't set out to do, he created Uncle Drew. Right. And he created it, it wasn't from a Nike thing, it was from, I think uh, it might have been Pepsi, Pepsi One, or whatever. He had a regional Pepsi One budget, and he did commercials on the internet, for the internet. And it blew up on the internet, and they said, no, we go, then they aired it. Mm -hmm. And then they said, let's go and shoot it again. Let's get the big boy cameras. They did it. Matter of fact, I think the second Uncle Drew commercial was shot at uh, at Jim Gillian Park, yep. where I used to play it back in the day, in the back. And I was like, wow, he just did something. And you think about it, his idea turned into a movie. The movie. It, it turned into a movie. It turned into the point where his popularity was like, Nike was like, wow, he just won a championship. Everybody's cool with him. He got a he got his own character. He has something with within him. Yeah. He has intellectual property that he can create at any single any moment. And he did that. Create his own shoe. He had the top selling shoe. You know, Kobe has great intellectual property. He can create. He was creating. Yeah, I want my shoe to feel light like this. I want this input. PG has great input, intellectual mm-hmm. property. We all have the ability to create intellectual property because as a culture, we've always created. We yeah. created civilization. <laughs> right. So me having a good idea, I'm supposed to have a good idea. You can steal it. That's cool. I'll, I'll, I'll create something else. That's how I think. Yes. That's how I think. You know, um, and that's how I was with N one. That's how I was with a lot of things I've done. Um, even from the motion capture to the, the the choreography to the movies, so forth. Um, I do commercials right now where I do casting for. I own a company. We do casting for TV commercials. I've done an iconic commercial that included Tom Brady and Morgan Freeman. I did uh, help do the commercial with uh, Stefan. I mean, with Steph Curry. Just recently with Under Armour. I did an iconic Gatorade commercial with Kanye West music in the background. I've done all this within the past year and a half. You know, creating a company out here, one of my best friends. So, like, you got to think about what this culture does. Like, how many doors it opens and how yeah. many different things you can touch and, and be involved in. And it's unfortunate that our kids don't look at it from that perspective. And the parents don't look at it from that perspective. They don't look at it like... Why am I going to this school? I should go to this school right here because their alumni base is amazing and they'll be able to give my son an opportunity outside of basketball after life. Because guess what? If I get drafted to the NBA and I play 15 years, that's an amazing... Man. You know how much money you make in 15 years? <laughs> right. You make $400 million. Okay. So you make four hundred million. You finish your career, and you end up. You have about one hundred and fifty, two hundred million dollars left. And you're let me see, ninety. That's what thirty four years old. You are a young man. <laughs> what you gonna do with this money? If you don't do something with it, you're gonna spend it. Right. Because your bills still matriculate. It's still going. That 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 ad machine is still <laughs> going. So you want to have those alumni. You want to be able to go back to school, take a class in the summertime, get your degree in something that you love. Why aren't more NBA players owners of franchises? We've seen guys like um, Jamal Mashburn. We've seen, uh, hell, uh, my man Ocho Cinco. Everybody mm-hmm. keep thinking he's broke. He's like, man, I got it. He's like, this they say my net worth is online. He said, here's my bank account. <laughs> He owns McDonald's franchises. Right. Uh, we have guys like, uh, people don't know, Vinny Johnson, who played for the Detroit Pistons back in the days. Yeah. He um, took advantage of being in Detroit and learning the, the auto industry business, the auto industry business, not the car business, the industry, making parts and so on and so forth. And he's worth upwards of $500 million. A guy named Junior Bridgman. And mind you, Vinny made $5 million over his NBA career. 
So wow. you take that time and you invest in yourself in the summers and you learn and you you grow and you branch out. Yes. You know, Dave Bing is one of the guys that um, I felt, think opened the doors for those guys in the Detroit area because he was involved in uh, the steel business. You know, Bing Steel, whatever he had out in Detroit back in the days. You have a guy like Junior Bridgman who um, owns a bunch of Wendy's franchises. Um, I think he's worth like three, four, five hundred million dollars. Yep. Magic Johnson with the Starbucks and all these things. Shaq. Why yeah, aren't we, as parents, why aren't we talking about life after basketball or what if basketball does not work for us? Because the percentage of players that actually make it from high school to college is 1%. High major, that is. Well, not Division One. Division two, if you count division two, is two percent. So ninety-eight percent of the kids at these tournaments will not play division one or division two basketball. But you cannot tell a parent whose kid is averaging twenty-five points a game playing seventh grade basketball that he's not gonna be a pro because he got all these videos up, he got all these things up. But me, I can't go to those games. Because I'm gonna tell you the truth. And you know what you're gonna say? Oh man, you a hater. Yep. Well, guess what? <laughs> I don't have to like anything. You like vanilla ice cream? I hate it. That make me a hater? <laughs> you wear Under Armour sneakers. I don't like them. They don't feel good on my feet. Does that make me a hater? No, that's my truth. Yeah. Or how about I tell you the truth? I have never given a parent faulty information. That means I've never been wrong. That means if I see your kid playing a certain way and I say to you, mm, don't do that. Or mm, don't go to that school. Don't think that I'm hating on you. Think that I actually care. Yeah. And I'm giving you inside information as to why. I can have give you an example. I had a kid, hmm, I had a war with them. I had a kid go to Duke. He's like my nephew. It didn't work out. Um, then I had another kid who was interested in Duke, and I connected them, and I said, take the Duke offer because it's a high-profile offer, but they don't play your style of basketball. Duke guards need to be jump shooters because of the way they play. You have to look at mm -hmm. their offense, how their offense runs. That's not you. You're more of a Kentucky guy. Mm -hmm. I don't care who else goes there. I think I know exactly who you're yeah. talking about. <laughs> I said, you can go to Kentucky. Mm. He's like, oh, well, my, my AAU teammate, he committed to Kentucky. So what? You're right. better than him. It doesn't matter. And Cal will play multiple point guards. Yeah. A great college team is a team with great guards. Absolutely. So it doesn't matter. He didn't listen. Ended up going to Duke. No disrespect to, to Coach K and that organization, that system, but they have a specific system that they play. For that player was not a fit. It was not a fit. Now, if you have that type of player, you're as Coach K, I don't care if he fits or not, I want that guy on my team. <laughs> right. He's an amazing athlete, he can help us, so on and so forth, but it's not going to help him reach his dreams. There's no so people will say, well, this school is the school of my dreams. The school of your dreams is a school that actually helps you achieve your dreams, reach your dreams. So if you think it's this school, it might not be. You have to find that school that fits you, that helps you reach your dreams. Big dream yes. of playing the NBA, possibly. I feel like that's what a lot of the guards that are in the NBA did. The yes. John Morantz, the Steph Currys, the Dame Lillards. They went to the school that wanted them, wanted to develop them, and mm -hmm. they saw the dreams. Oh, you want to be in the NBA? I could help you get there. And mm -hmm. they did it, and they just believed in themselves. I do want to play devil's advocate a little. At what point are you balancing putting the confidence in a kid to strive for their goals and being honest about where they're at? And can your development change that? Your development can change it if the child is disciplined enough. And if you see... Okay, so there are kids that have this thing. It's not a new thing. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's called talent. Everybody is not the talented 450. Guys who are in that talented 450 are guys that you show them a movement, not a move, a movement. They can take that movement 
and they can flip it around and do something even more elite with it than you thought. Mm. You can't predict how good a kid is going to be. What you have to do, is you have to put all the positive, the good things, the correct things into him, pour it into him. If he's able to absorb it, and then he takes it and he just, mm -hmm. you can be part of this club. But if you have kids that you're pouring things into and they reject this, I don't want to do that, reject that. No, I don't want to do that. I want to do it like this. No, I want to do it like that. You can sit there and you can say, everybody can't go. That's interesting. That everybody can't of, go. That makes a lot of sense for the kids who are, have that projection mm -hmm. right now to be a pro. Mm -hmm. That, But they I, don't absorb. They don't absorb yeah. everything. I'm talking about the ones who do because it's less of them, right? And I can yes. Johnny Juzang was like that. Mm -hmm. I would show him something. He learned he learned how to play off of playing 2K. He watched 2K. You know, those moves are pretty real because they got the motion capture. He was literally in eighth grade doing moves that he learned on 2K. I was like, who taught you that? He didn't really have a trainer before. He was like, I learned on 2K. And I'm like, oh, let me actually show you some stuff. And there's been many other people who have developed his game since then, right? This is talking about middle school, Johnny. But then I knew I was like, He's special. And then now, one is Elijah Arenas. So, for the last, for his middle school years, mm -hmm. two days, just been getting after. I don't know if I could teach him any other skill in the world. Like, I'm out, my bag is out. But the way he applies it on the court and the extra glitches he puts to it, I'm like, that's talent. Man, that's <laughs> talent. And, yeah. and you can get certain kids and put them in those situations to display that talent. And then something happens. They run out of talent. Whoa, like Space Jam? Yeah. How's that happen? It's like, <laughs> doo -doo 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 -doo. like a video game. Yeah. He done ran out of talent. That's it. That's as far as he can go with it. Mm. You think about this. You think about where John Morant was as a freshman at Murray State and where he is now. Talent kept going and going, kept getting better and better and better. Mm -hmm. If you look at um, you look at Bradley Beal stats, you look at Devin Booker stats, you look at um, wow, what's my man uh, for the Chicago Bulls? Uh, Light skin boy, jump out of the gym. Uh, Zach. Zach Levine. You look at their stats as rookies, and look at their stats now. Risen. Yep. You know what I'm saying. They kept being able to add talent, add talent. So um, Michael Jordan would add a new move every year in the summer, a couple moves. Kevin Durant talks about adding a new move every year as a pro. I want to add something unstoppable. I want to add a new move offensively. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We see LeBron's game evolve into more of a jump shooter than a driver. Yes, he still has athletic glitches, you know, where he can just, just oh, wait, what? <laughs> You know, but we saw him add, you know, those guys didn't run out of talent. Some guys get to a certain point and they run out of talent. You don't have enough talent to take you over the hump to get over that mountain. And so what is that? Is that talent? God given talent? Is That's that, God. It's like, That's, you can't like a, explain each man that. has a measure of faith. Each man has a measure of talent. Yes. Mm. You, you have a certain amount of each man has a certain amount of everything and you run out of certain things. Man. Unfortunately, you do. I mean, as men, we deal with um, testosterone. The older you get, the less testosterone you have. That keeps you up. That, that keeps your weight up. I mean, intact. That you're, You can eat whatever you want to and never gain a pound. <laughs> Those are testosterone levels. You get to a certain age, your testosterone level goes down the drain. <laughs> And you gain weight. Me, I'm used to being 185, 190 pounds. I'm a big boy now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I have to deal with that. That's life. Yeah. You know? So you want to think the same when it comes to talent. You can get to the point where you've run out of talent. No matter how hard you work, you cannot shoot the ball like that. You cannot run past that guy. So you have to figure something else out. There are players who have been smart enough to figure things out and create other ways of being successful. And they've stayed in the league. Some of them say, well, I'm going to be a great teammate. Right. Some of them say, well, I'm going to be a spot-up shooter. Mm -hmm. Some of them say, well, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to cheer. 
Because my team cleaves. I need like, yeah. a couple guys <laughs> on my team that are great teammates, that cheer, that are always positive. If I'm a if I'm a corporation, I need that glue guy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So they ran out of talent, but they found a way to stick around. Udonis Haslam. Yeah. He ran out of talent. He old. But he's still in the league. Why? He figured out what he needs to do to stay. He's a positive influence. He understands the culture. It's his city. He yeah. understands that city. He understands that winning culture that he's been a part of for 19 years, so forth, 20 years, whatever. Yeah. You can't replace that with anyone. You know? So that's the thing, man. There's some kids, and there's some kids who start late. And those are the kids that the NBA they love because they're like, well, this kid's been playing since he was eight years old. And all through middle school, he was a number one player in the country. Hmm. Now he's in high school. And he's not. Think about this. How many players in history, basketball history that we know of, from the ranking, from the ranking situation, have been the number one freshman? In the country and finished as the number one senior. I don't think of any. I don't know any. The only person I can actually remember might have been Kenny Anderson. Mm. Wow. Was Le- LeBron? No. No, LeBron no, wasn't, wasn't because Kendrick Perkins was higher than LeBron. Yeah. Their right. junior year. Yeah. Think about that. That's crazy. Yeah. Marvin Bagley, maybe? No. No, because he didn't finish. Because, anymore. yeah, he's, he left. He was already a year, you know, reclass yeah, or reclass, whatever. Yeah. Oh, man. No, that's uh, that's what I tell. I, that is what I tell parents because they come to me because we have some good middle schoolers. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, don't worry about being ranked in middle school. College coaches don't look at that. They don't care about that. NBA uh, scouts aren't in our gym. Uh, we do have, actually, some pro teams who want to come see these middle schoolers now because the game's getting younger with all that. But I tell them, I want you to be ranked number one your senior year. Mm-hmm. I don't care about freshman year. Let's be top 100, 75, 25. Then we get to that top, you know, yes. that top it's spot. It's easy to hunt rather than be hunted. Mm. Because, you know, um, name drop. I have a young boy I've been working with since seventh grade. His name is Isaiah Collier. And when I met Zay um, as a seventh grader, he was in a in a in a high school camp, so he's going through the drills and so forth. He's a cool little young kid. I'm thinking he's like a tenth grader or something like that. After the camp, I'm sitting there talking to him like, man, I don't know about you in basketball, man. You, you about to be a junior or something? He's like, no, I'm in the seventh grade. It's <laughs> like what? <laughs> like who is your parents? Because he was competing. Yeah. But you could see physically they were bumping him and so forth. But he was competing, and without the physical, he would make the mental plays all the time, the correct plays every single time. It's like, no, um, Coach Larry, that's my uncle, that's my dad. So six, seven years later, he's number one player in the country. Mm -hmm. He wasn't number one back then. I think early there was like, fourth and fifth grade, it was like, oh, he's the best player in the country, stuff like that, but that's not real, right? you know, because we don't have a, you don't have a, a real sample size. So I think all through high school, he was like middle of the pack, middle of the pack, and I always felt that that's a great position to be in because you want to hunt. Yeah. Because when you're hunting, you got an X on your back. You don't mm-hmm. see who's hunting you necessarily. You right. don't know who got in their head, yeah, I'm going to get at you. And when I get at you, I got something for you. It's hard to be that guy that's hunted because every single time you get on the floor, you have to realize this guy's coming for my crown. Yep. And very few people have ever aligned to that, that, that thought process. Michael Jordan did. Yeah. But Michael Jordan was crazy. Mm-hmm. To be an NBA player, you have to be crazy. To do something over and over and over and over again and expecting a different result means you have a level of insanity. I'm shooting on this little rim. I'm taking a thousand shots a day. A thousand. Can you imagine if every day we did this? Expecting to hear a perfect sound? Hmm. They call you crazy, right? Yeah. So to be able to do something a thousand times a day, expecting the same result over and over or a different result 
is a level of insanity, which is why development is so boring, which is why everybody's not built to be developed, which is why people run out of talent, which is why there's only 450 guys in the league. Mm. And actually, it's not 450 anymore. It's 5'10", 5'40", because they've added the two, uh, the two more two-way guys. They've added three more two-way guys. But the guaranteed contracts are at 450. So we always say the talented 450, elite 450. But no, it's this this game has so much depth. There's so much culture. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Basketball for me is the maybe soccer. But basketball to me is the only sport I feel that has its own subculture. Think about that. No one no one stood outside for the new Under Armour cleats that were coming out. Right. No one stood outside for the new football jerseys or whatever that were coming out. But we did that for basketball sneakers. Oh, for yeah. sneakers. Yeah. We did that. No one got killed because the new um, fitted hat. Mm. You, oh, you got that? Give me that. No one robbed you. Like they robbed you for. They was robbing, killing you for Jordans. Yeah. We dress like basketball players. Basketball players have taken on fashion and taken it to another level. They literally have the cameras at the elevators when you go into the arena. You are coming from the players' parking lot. We're coming upstairs, and the first thing I do if I'm with a player, I move over to the side. Yeah, I, he got on something special. I got on something regular. <laughs> Get him in right. the picture. Because I want to be the Wizard of Oz anyway. Yeah. I just tweeted recently, I don't want to be famous. I don't want to be well-known. I just want to be paid well and hard to get in touch with. Yep. That's why, for me, the few players that I work with, like, you're not going to see no videos of us working because I don't want you copying what we do. Why? Because if you don't get the total story about why we're doing that movement, you're not getting the the true representation of what I do. Like I work with a player. It's crazy because I was in the gym this summer, spring, summer, and I'm working with players. And later on, I see my movements being replicated by other trainers. And I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. Um, it's really interesting because you're replicating someone from the outside in. You really need to be inside to understand why yeah. we're doing that. And it's a, I guess it's a compliment because somebody sees your work and they're like, yo, that's dope. I'm, I'm going to do that. Everybody does that. But we've lost the ability to be apprenticed. To go under someone's wing and learn the inside information. If I were a stock trader and I just, on the outside, oh, he, he bought that stock? Okay, I'm going to buy it. And then he dumps that stock real quick. Why did he dump it? Oh, I'm keeping this. This looks like a good stock. And then that stock tanks. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to ask me, yo, why did you dump that stock real quick? Because this, 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 and this. The yes. insider info that the top guys have that they say is illegal, but the top guys have it. You're not that successful trading stocks. No <laughs> way in the world that you right. know that this stock was going to be there unless you had some inside information. Well, I have inside information because I've been doing this for 29 years. So if yes. I look at a guy who's t a trainer that's crazy, he's hot on the internet, and he's 35 years old, right? I've been training for 29 years. So by the time you actually understood how to train and develop someone, I'd already done that. So I don't have 29 years ahead of a person. I have 29 years plus the time it took you to figure out how to train and develop someone. So guess what? I have a wealth of knowledge that I'd love to pass to you. Just ask the question. Yeah. I have people, I tell people, my phone number is on my Twitter. If you have a question, call me. Yeah. I will give you all the information necessary. It, the game is to be told, not sold. I reverse it. I don't want to sell it. I don't want to put it sell online and just 
You said it backwards, but yes, you do. I said it backwards. Yes. You said it the right your way. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it should be told. I don't. Why? Yeah. So guys are making a lot of money, just putting moves online and saying, "Hey, if you sign up to this description, I'll do this." I didn't do that. Guys, I watch people. Guys told me information. I had OGs like Per Washington that showed me moves. Anthony Joseph, Daryl Flowers that showed me moves. They didn't say, well, give me $5 at all. Mm. That's corny to me. That's well, not of the culture to me. So I agree with you. I, I, I love the concept of mentorship, apprenticeship, right? That's, I actually learned, that's how I learned the game. I was training for one company and they taught me how to get basketball players in shape. Mm -hmm. they, I wasn't a developer. I was a workout guy. Mm -hmm. On the other side of the court was Chris Johnson, who's mm -hmm. developing guys, right? I could, and I'm looking at what he's doing, and I'm like, this. I, I didn't know who he was at the time. I, you know, I see the NBA players he's working. I'm like, man, why is he an NBA trainer? Like, no idea. Fast forward a year later, I'm in the gym with him, just rebounding, like, let me see what this is all about. And <clears throat> in two weeks, I'm like, oh, oh, my gosh. I've been doing this all wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, what have I been doing? And so since then, that's the system I use. But I was taught play by play, moment by moment, why, how mm -hmm. he allowed me to ask him questions and mm -hmm. dive into what is this development process about. And mm -hmm. so I'm, I 100% agree. So I do think the guys who do sell curriculum online, there's something to it as being able to reach the masses and at least give them a piece of the game because they out here wilding out with no information. Mm -hmm. And so there's something to, hey, I can get this out to the masses, at least give them some type of structure, some type of... But the problem is, is it the correct information? Your popularity doesn't mm -hmm. mean you know. Just well, because no, you're I think, popular? I think, I think the result, I think you should be buying it from the people who train NBA players, who've developed multiple NBA players that you can That's see. a problem too, though. Okay, talk to me. The problem is, as a high school player, I should not be trying to emulate an NBA player. Because in high school, in college, you're not allowed to do what they do. You, you can, like in the state of Georgia, you can't sidestep, do a move and sidestep. They're going to call travel. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, man. Not, maybe not in Cali. I, said, I love Cali. But <laughs> California basketball... <laughs> The reason why California has the most pros and always has is because the style of basketball they play in the state of California is m more translatable to the NBA than any other state. Mm. In New York, we're ball dominant. We're ball handlers. In the state of Georgia, they're athletic, which is starting to be a thing. Florida, they're athletic. They're more football than basketball. Texas, they're athletic. They're more football than basketball. They're athletic. But the way they've always played in the state of California, run and gun. Run, mm. shoot, jump. Yeah. Now you get a few guys that dribble. Baron Davis don't know this, but Baron Davis in and out, cross, up fake. That's my move. I brought that to California in 1987. 87. Think about that. Man. You didn't see anybody up faking, crossing over, hezzy, blown by in California in 1987. I don't know if you were even born yet, though. I was but one. I was one. You was one? one. <laughs> I was one. <laughs> <laughs> he don't know that. What we talked about earlier, the moves travel. Yeah, based on people relocating, going places, and so forth. But when he brought that to the game, and then you started having dudes that was really focusing on ball handling in, in Cali, like, whoa, like James Hart? Yeah. Like, whoa. I mean, and California is one of the sunshine states. California is a state where the kids get more vitamin D, mm -hmm. which helps grow bones, helps grow muscle development, and so on and so forth. You think about it, the most athletic kids come from the sunshine states, the states that have sunshine, which is California, Texas, uh, New Orleans, yeah. Alabama, mm -hmm. Georgia. Those states that get the most sunshine per year have the most athletic players. Florida and Cali always have the fastest people in track. Yeah. Alabama, those places, sunshine, vitamin D. So there's a lot. To, this, this game is so vast. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's a subculture within the culture. There's so many things about the game. Here goes a question for you. Is a guy an NBA trainer if he works with NBA players or if he's trained an amateur and turned him into an NBA player? How many people that say they're NBA trainers 
have trained a kid that was unranked and helped him get to the NBA. Right. It's a very small list. So, very small list. I always tell people that. I never, you will never see NBA trainer next you, you to You can me. say, I, I train I work, NBA players. I work with NBA players. That's, and I say this. I work with Chris Johnson, who's an NBA trainer, and have trained these players. But you're a development guy. So, mm-hmm. you kind of fit into... You're one of your guys that you develop will play in the NBA. Will. So then you, yes. so then, then you're it. on that path. But yes. very few people have the fortitude, have the knowledge, have the understanding of development yes. to be able to take a regular kid. Yes. And find out does he have that talent? Yes. But you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Because you're gonna have kids in your program that are elite, and. They're going to be ranked high in middle school and early on in high school. And by their junior year, it's oh, over. I've already had them. Yeah, that's already happened. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. We've seen it. Mm-hmm. They ran out of talent. Mm. But maybe they did too much too early. Yes. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Because think about it. If you're nine years old and you're averaging 40, that means you're averaging 40 doing it a certain way. That means you're shooting from your chest right here. Yep. You're shooting underhand layups. Usually way more athletic, developed a lot quicker exactly. athletically. But now you get to the point where you've plateaued. And these underhand layups are getting beat to the stands. And that shot you're shooting from here, you can't get it off. Because you didn't take that summer like Steph, excuse me, Steph, Steph on, excuse me, Steph Curry did and raised his shot from here to here. Yeah. His shot is here. Mm-hmm. He doesn't shoot here. His shot is here, but it went from here to, it was, it was here at first, in middle school. See, I seen all these kids play when they were younger. You know what I'm saying? I remember people laughing at a little skinny kid. You know what I'm saying? It was a little Charlotte team. I'm like, he got a shot though. Hmm. And the advantage some of these kids have as children of NBA players is a very slight advantage that people never think about. When they're young, and they're able to go to the games, and they're able to be ball boys and stuff like that, they get to shoot in arenas. Mm. So now they have an understanding of depth perception. Yep. There's nothing behind the backboard. It's, it's, it's just air. <laughs> when you're in a high school gym, there's a wall directly behind that backboard. Yep. So shooting jump shots is not as, as difficult. But when there's nothing there, and you have to shoot on just a stationary thing, it's a lot different. So going from a high school gym to playing in the Carrier Dome in Syracuse, you're not going to have the same jump shot. Right. It's going to feel totally different. You're going to feel like you're just shooting the ball and it's just floating in the air. Right. So coming up with an NBA parent and you're allowed to shoot in these facilities and so on and so forth, think about, think about a lot of the kids who, whose parents played in the league and then they become NBA players. The ma- a lot of them are shooters. Yeah. Is yeah. that a coincidence? Oh, no. I, I mean, I knew that. Even Bronny. <laughs> right. People that, don't... That, that's why I just thought, I thought about that. People love hate on that kid. That kid's special. Yeah. I, don't, I have, been, have had arguments online and in person. <laughs> or if it wasn't for his daddy, I'm like, bro, I've seen this kid, man. We played against him. But Wheeler High School, we played against Sierra Canyon. My young boy got sick. He was in the back throwing up. We had a, a lead. By the time he came back in the game, like fourth quarter, Bronny had already taken off. I missed all that. I had to catch it on the replay. I'm like, what the hell happened? <laughs> Bronny outran, outjumped, <laughs> shot the ball. Yeah. I'm, set, I'm sitting on the bench. I'm watching this kid read screens. His IQ, man. That's what He's reading see. screens. He's like, okay, defender's on my hip here. I'm going to curl this way. He's on here. I'm going to pin down this way. And he's shooting NBA threes off the catch. He can run, sprint, shoot. Yep. He jumps like Jesus. The boy just takes off. He's in the USC practices, one step, windmill. No problem. Head by the backboard. I'm like, yeah. if, I mean, everybody's in awe of him. So I need to go to practice with you one day. You do. It's yeah. amazing. Oh, that, <laughs> that team will be top five in the country. Ooh, I like it. People think, oh, USC? It's players, dummy. Yeah. Kentucky always. stunk before Calipari got back there. <laughs> they stunk. He brought a culture there. Yeah. 
So what we're able to do at SC is bring a culture. Yeah. You know, I'm looking at Isaiah like West Coast basketball is translatable to the NBA. You like to play up and down. You can he can get up the court in two dribbles, which is ridiculous. Right. You have these wing players. Mm -hmm. You have a coach who, when he coached uh, Florida Gulf Coast, That's it. what they called them? They they called them some Lob City, Dunk City. They were Dunk called City. Dunk City. Dunk City. Why wouldn't Seven you want to play offense. for a guy mm -hmm. who wants to run like that? And wow, having Bronny on the team. That's hella marketing. USC is going to be the hottest ticket in town oh, for next sure. to the Lakers. Yep. They'll be the hottest ticket in town because they're right downtown from each other. The, the front row is going to look like celebrity row at the Lakers game. Yep. Like, why wouldn't you want to play in that kind of atmosphere? And you have so many amazing pieces. You have players who can play, who can be winners. You have a scoring Boogie Ellis who came back. You have... The leading shot blocker in the Pac-12 and Big Josh. You have Kobe Johnson, who was an elite defender. You know what I'm saying? Always in top mm -hmm. tops and steals. And he can knock down the three at 36, 37%. Yep. You have we have put DJ Robin in there, who's an amazing defender. He has a whole videotape of him taking charges. He's a like you want him on your team. Another NBA kid. And he shoots, Ryan. he shoots the ball at 38% from the three-point line. And is Vince back? Vince went back till till January, okay. but the fact that he'll be back right. as a seven foot one dude. Yep. And you have the best point guard in the country. I'm gonna run your offense, and nobody's gonna stop him from getting up the court. You're, they're not stopping him. Yeah. John Wall just ran by you. Derrick Rose <laughs> ran by you. Yeah. De'Aaron Fox ran by you. Like bye. What you? I'm, what you want me to do? Three moves here? No. Get out of here. Bye bye. <laughs> You're open. You're open. Oh, fake layup. Oh, jump shot. That's basketball. So, yeah. and just even me helping to curate that team or them allowing me to help curate that team and bring players there that I think will be amazing for the team, for the city, for the school, for the culture. Like, I couldn't want a better job. Yeah. Like, but I don't even think of this as a job. This is a dream. This is like, I teach people how to play basketball. I'm I'm working with Jordan Poole so three was it two summers ago? Not last summer, summer before that. When when I got the, the I was blessed enough to be able to work with him, it wasn't a, yo, take him, he's gonna be this. It was he's good, you know, back and forth to the G League, let's see what you can do with him. I'm just like, I don't have any expectations. First workout we get into, I'm like, I study his movements. I'm like, let's create moves based on your movements, what your body's comfortable with. Mm. His sidestep. The sidestep is more powerful than stepping back because your body isn't meant to push backwards, but it can push sideways. More powerful, you create more space doing that. Let's snatch your, let your, your crossover. Let's not snatch it across, let's snatch it back. Mm -hmm. hmm, the in and out. The overhand in and out. All these things are movements that work with his body. Yeah. So we're able to create moves that work for him. They didn't think he was going to come back with a handle and movements like that. They thought he was going to be shooter because they had the assistant coach. One of the assistant coaches came down from Golden State, Chris, who was super cool. And it was all shooting practices, shooting drills. And I'm watching, I'm just like, that's all y'all want from him? Mm. So he came back with a whole different skill set. They're like... Whoa, wait a minute. Hmm. Let's take advantage of this. Yeah. You know? And he has. So what we're doing now, what we've been doing for the past three weeks, they're gonna be talking about him like they talk about Kyrie. His movements for this next season in Washington. So you just took what he already does and polished it, or you no, been we've able to develop new more? Stuff. Oof. It, it's Oof. new stuff and it's it's like like all we can do is smile because it's <laughs> it's and it's crazy. Uh, the other day he said, "Are you a visionary?" I said, "My email is visionary38 at gmail .com. I was say, I think that has something to do with it. Yes, <laughs> the name of my company is Visionary Vanguard. Um, so I've always had that word visionary around me, 
And we spoke earlier and we talked about intellectual property that requires you to be a visionary. So for me, this is all a dream. This is all me realizing a dream. If I couldn't play in the NBA, I'm helpful in helping guys reach those goals of making it to college as far as Division I or Division II or even NAI, whatever, helping them play college basketball. And a good amount of these guys have made it to the NBA, wow. which I don't, I, I don't. Can you let the people know some players that you have worked with that you do feel comfortable sharing? I'll give you a couple. Let me see. <laughs> <laughs> it's a couple. No, I think it's good to know because you're here in LA now, right? Full time. So a lot of people, you know, you moved from Atlanta yeah. and you were doing your thing there. Now you've been in LA for almost two years. Yeah. Well, it's my third summer. Yeah. Third. Yeah. So three summers. Yeah. And um, so the people know, you know, but I don't work with everybody. I know you don't. And that's good. That, that's that's to. that's great. Mm -hmm. No, I like I I don't work with a lot of people. I I'm about to go work with you. So I can learn from you. That's what I'm going to do because that's fine. I, I have yeah. so much that I, I like to pass on. That's, to and that's what I want. I know there's it's something. So important. There is a legacy that you have that needs to pa be passed on to the basketball people of the world, mm -hmm. and um, I love the honor of being that person to help get that and do it your it's way. Just information. Like that's, for me, it's not. It. I don't. I'm not the the beholder or the the the. You know, I'm not the gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. of information it's information like yeah. studying like it's crazy like i studied gilbert arenas who's like superman on the podcast now yeah. you know i studied paul george i studied all their movements to the point where i can teach a player to be like them but the psychology like the mental aspect of it I can't teach them. That's something you have to have. Like, Gilbert was crazy. Some of the shots he take was crazy. His work ethic was crazy. Paul George was an and one mixtape baby. Yeah. He's, I talked, I mean, two summers ago, I went to him, I said, bro, you know you'd average, you could add five points a game to your normal average if you just played out the mid post and just got some easy buckets in the mid post. I said, I watched your synergy. Every time you get the ball in the mid post, you score. Like 70% of the time. He's like, I'm not ready to do that yet. I still got some wiggle. <laughs> he still has an amazing handle he can get off. You know? And that's a choice. And, you know, now he's an amazing person in the, in the, in the podcast field or whatever. Yeah. So being able to hear stories from these guys, the one thing they can't pass on is, is, is their, their mental approach and the psychology, like the, that aspect. I still from childhood trauma. <laughs> Yes, it, I, I really believe it. It's built from yeah, I won't say trauma or just no, their, their childhood experience, but a lot of that greediness and, like you said, it's insanity to be able to be a perfectionist like they are, or that mentally tough to continue to grow with what they do, it comes from that childhood trauma. And but they've been able to work through it and put it in a special place to make it a productive thing in their life and not uh, a hindrance in their life. So, all mm -hmm. right, so you don't mind sharing some of the people that you've worked with? Yeah. Okay, all right. I'm old, so I'll be having to, I'll be having like a list. I will start back in 1960. Who were you with then? <laughs> oh man! <laughs> so, the first guy I worked with that, um, and he's so dear to my heart. I'm still looking for him. It's a guy named Jamison Brewer, um, 2001 draft, uh, Indiana Pacers. Isaiah drafted him, six five guard out of Auburn, Atlanta kid, and we used to work out when he was in the eighth grade. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So I watched him grow over years, and that was my first guy. So I'm like, 2001? God, that's 22 years ago. Yeah. My first guy went pro 22 years ago? Hmm. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. You know? Exactly. So, got him. I've worked with, um, I'll just get some simple names. Uh, Jordan Adams, who uh, played for UCLA, mm -hmm. drafted by... Um, uh, the Grizzlies back then. Yeah. Um, I've worked a few times with uh, Terry Rozier when he was an amateur. I worked with Le Le um, DeMar DeRozan as a pro. Um, just once, Kevin Knox, who you, you've seen <laughs> our workouts. Um, Mike Scott. Um, Terrence Ross. Um, the year T. Ross broke the NBA record as the first person to ever hit 203 pointers coming off the bench. That was our first summer together. 
you know. And that was pretty easy work because I was able to figure out what the coaching staff wanted. So they're going to run him off pin downs and curls. I'm like, easy work. Yeah, so I want to have for work. And he would run it. At, he would do the workouts at game speed, you know. And so that, it's easy when you have a professional that understands his role. Yeah. So for him to be able to do that, you know, he got a big contract. And he's a, he's a simple and amazing person. So, you know, he's a family guy. So that money going to last him forever. Yep. You know, he might have one more contract left in him. So um, Jalen Green, I did three and a half months of pre-draft work with him, which um, changed his game a lot. Um, his handle got a lot better. Um, when he worked out for the Detroit Pistons, they said this, it was literally one of the best workouts they've ever seen in history. He was in such great shape. We had an amazing uh, strength guy that worked with him, a guy named uh, Jason Estrada. He works out of El Segundo area. Amazing. He works with DeMar. You realize DeMar Rose never had an injury. Right. Yeah. It's, you know, his strength guy. You know, he's mm -hmm. amazing with that stuff. He's so holistic and so forth. Uh, Jordan Poole. Um, Jordan Poole isn't somebody that I helped get to the NBA, but we definitely, as a as a team, helped reshape his game. And team, the team, me and him, like we'll go back and forth on movements. Like, what should you do here? What should you do here? Like, how do you, do you feel comfortable doing this? All right, whatever we do on that side, we'll try it on this side. But if it doesn't feel comfortable on this side, we know that you only do that movement on the left side. So now when you do this movement. What is the defender doing? So I'm the placebo defender. And okay, I have to, I'm gonna admit it. I'm doing like Eminem, I'm admit it before he actually says it. Cause he because we don't we don't mention my name, we don't talk about me as a trainer. I don't I'm not in the videos. I wanna be shook nice set all up in the videos. <laughs> no, dancing in I ain't the back of dancing. the videos, yeah. When there's no video proof. So I could be lying. Okay. But he did do a move last year. And I kind of, my feet, what happened was, <laughs> I think the shoe, the was shoe it was, my <laughs> shoe was real tight. And then the shoelace like came loose, right? And I think it was like extra long shoelace. And I might have fell. I might have. I don't remember because it was so long ago. The court had a dead spot. And then. That's what it was. You know, yeah. the, you know the court I'm talking about. Yep. And I fell and he said, <laughs> he said, bro, you fell and you ain't put your hands out to brace yourself. You just fell. I said, well. <laughs> What had happened was, I know that if I'd have put my hand, I might have broke my wrist or something. So I decided to just take it on the shoulder. So he might have made me fall once, but that's because I wasn't paying attention in my shoes and the dead spot and all that. So his movements are crazy. Yeah. If not for all the BS that went on that year that I think affected his mental or whatever and just his happiness, I think, you know, um, it's a different team. Yeah. But now that he has his own team, that they're going to allow him to bring a culture there. You know, him and Kuzma, I think that's going to be an amazing yeah. um, two-man squad. You know, light-skinned folks, man, y'all just taking I mean, everything. Like God, is, we dang. never went anywhere. People yeah. think we went away. Nah, it was like a dead oh, spot for y'all from like Chris Williams, I'll be <laughs> sure. And then MJ was, and Wesley Stipes like, nah, we got this. After he stabbed Christopher Williams in the hand in New Jack City, you know, and said what he said, oh, it just kind of, but y'all ain't got, yeah, really. <laughs> y'all really on the, y'all, man, y'all uh, making it tough yeah. on us, bro. Hey, that's what we're supposed to do. Okay. All right. But, yeah. I mean, I got a few others, but for me, it's. No, that's, that's good to know that, you know, people need to know who you, you know, who you've developed and where you're coming from and your story because it's impactful to the overall basketball culture. And for the people in Southern California specifically where we're really trying to make an impact to know, hey, don't go to Goof Trainer. Come talk to Mark. Don't go to, you know, the weak coach. Go to the coach who's winning championships and develops college players. And that's what this is all about is I'm not calling out the people who are bad. I'm letting you know who's good. Deal with them. But I will let you know who's bad at the same time. Like you ask me, we I'm gonna be real, and I'm gonna call that person and say, "Hey, this person wanted to work with you, but I don't think you're <laughs> you're equipped yeah, to develop." Yeah, there's a lot of um, um, bad. There are a lot of bad trainers, and I will call you a bad trainer if you're not giving people proper insight on the movements that they're doing, why they're doing it, or if you have a kid doing an advanced movement that they shouldn't be doing right now. Yeah. If you have a six-year-old doing an offhand layup 
you know, jumping off the, you know, I'm like, why are you doing that? He should be doing this first and this first. Why is he mm. doing this? You gonna hate me because you know? I have a different, I have a different view on that. You, you, you. At a young, at a six year, so this is my belief. If I have somebody who's never played the sport before, mm -hmm. that's one thing. If somebody's had training before, mm -hmm. I do more traditional. Mm -hmm. If somebody's never played ever, like the, I'm their first trainer for basketball, mm -hmm. I actually teach them that because it's normal to but them. But do you now. teach them both? Oh, absolutely. That's I the, teach that, all of it. That's oh, no, the no, difference. No. Oh, gotcha. You. Okay. You're saying people are just teaching, oh, yes. same hand, same foot. There's a lot that's, of kids that can't do this. A oh, lot of kids can't dribble okay. and do this. <laughs> that's wild. So as a trainer, if I'm seeing, because I teach this. Right, right, right. I teach it. Jordan, we we have a whole package of, same hand, you know same what I'm saying? Foot. Yep, touches, yep. Okay. But he also can go downhill and... And just make a regular, traditional yes, overhand. Because you want to have variety. You want to have, oh, you thought, oh, no, stupid, excuse me. Yes. But you have guys that go right to that. Yeah. That's... That's, That's like, okay, there's A, B, and C. You can't get to C without A. Right. How do you skip A? How do you skip A? <laughs> How do you skip A? Got you. No, okay. Then you will like me. Okay, cool. Yeah, like, no. <laughs> I, bro, I already, bro, I'm, come on. This, yeah. I, don't, I don't like everybody. That's just what it is. Yeah. And not liking you doesn't mean I don't like you personally. It, it just means I don't like what you teach. Yeah. But I like you, you know what I'm saying? So we, we've always been on the same, you know, yeah. same wavelength or whatever. So that's I got to come and learn more, not an man. Issue. Um, so we're going to move to the next segment of the show, my Rushmore, okay? Your Mount Rushmore. Ball handlers. Top four ball handlers all time or in the NBA? All time. All time, no matter where they were. All time. Because you dealt with N1 people who had all handle time. handles, so. Yeah. But I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to go NBA. NBA? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go NBA. So, I don't want to put them in any particular order. I just want to name them. And, yeah, it's all and top I, I can four. give no. you why. Okay. So, um, I'm not going to say Bob Cousy. Okay, I'm sorry. Bob, I'm not getting that. Um, uh, we have to put Kyrie Irving in that conversation. And Kyrie Irving... When he does stuff, he does not amaze me. Nothing he does amazes me. Not one single thing. And it's crazy because Iman Shumpert recently said Kyrie is the only player that will go at you with no plan. Mm. And I had to think about what he was saying. I was like, oh, yeah, that's correct. That's why he can go do a move. If you cut him off, he'll just go the other direction. Yeah. That's what you're supposed to do. Right. But Kyrie was taught the game by a father who played in my era. He's from the Bronx. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? His father, his father and Rod Strickland played together. They had the same uh -huh. style. So when you look at Kyrie, you look at his layup package, you're looking at, you're not looking at Rod Strickland's layup package. You're looking at Dedrick Irvin's layup package, which is similar to, to to Rod because they played together and in that era, in that area, those guys uptown, they did the overhand cross. In Brooklyn, we do the underhand cross. Well, Kyrie can do the overhand and the underhand. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Why? He studies the game. He's a hooper. You know what I'm saying? And he's fanatical about his layups, his handle. People don't realize Kyrie was a better shooter early on than a ball handler. If, there are videos of Kyrie as a freshman in high school shooting NBA threes mm. as a freshman. So his father knew what he was doing. I'm going to create a guy that can shoot the ball, so now you got to come out on me, now I'll just blow by you. Yeah. Kyrie's big move back in the days was his behind the back. He would hit you and then go behind the back. That was his big move first two years of high school. In and out, behind the back. You know what I'm saying? Then he can come back or whatever. He started adding all these things when he figured out, I don't ever have to stop my dribble. I can just beat you and just go by you. If you beat me here, I can keep my dribble alive and just go by you. Most guys, they learn a move. Yep. And if that move don't work, they pick up the ball. Yep. They're not real ball handlers. No. You know what I'm saying? But So Kyrie is, is, is definitely a savant uh, in regards to that. It doesn't amaze me. 
I just like seeing it. <laughs> but he has invented some things. The way he'll pick up his quick pickups are yeah. are, are great. His up and overs. He didn't Ball create. Placing. He didn't create that. Mm-hmm. But he's taking it to a different level with his ball handling ability. So he has to be in that conversation. Okay. Um, another guy is, and he's my all-time favorite, and that's Isaiah Thomas. Yeah. Isaiah Thomas. You look back his first year in the NBA, and there's a sequence where he's dribbling the ball, and they try to double him, and he'll back out, and he starts getting the ball real low, and he starts tapping yep. between his legs and just going, and he's just going to pull up jump shot. I'm like, whoa. Like, I watched him early on when he was playing with Kelly Trapuca, you know, who had the, the mullet or shag or whatever, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Michael Jordan dunked on him or whatever, like... I watched him, the early Isaiah, just get buckets, you know, because I, when I saw him at Indiana, when I saw that championship game, I was wondering, how was he able to get to the basket so easily? And he would just lay the ball up, regular layup all day long on a college defense. Anybody that's played college basketball, you have to understand how difficult it is to get a wide open layup in a half court set in college. Yeah. He got to the basket? <laughs> just lay up? What? How? What did he do? How spread was the floor? He was just amazing ball handler. Like the stuff he's done that people still can't do. Fast break, flip it under his hand, poop, catch it in the air, float, a little yeah. jump shot. Like, what? And Isaiah had bounce. Right. The one thing that, that got me is it's a commercial that you can look up. It's uh, Isaiah Thomas and Reggie Theus. You know Reggie Theus. I know Reggie Theus, yeah. Yeah, you know. Light skin, green eyes, pretty boy, curly one of, hair. One of us, yeah. One of y'all, one yeah. of y'all. When he's with y'all, yeah. <laughs> Six, seven, though. Yeah. Amazing ball handler. Mm. They had a commercial back in the days with cigarettes. And they were trying to tell you, you shouldn't smoke. And it was, you shouldn't smoke because you won't be able to dribble the ball like this. <laughs> so they both had cigarettes in their hand. They're trying to dribble the ball, and they messing up or whatever. Then they throw the cigarettes away, and they start dribbling. They start doing the figure eight. I'm like... So that became my thing. Like I do figure eight front, back, mm-hmm. so fast. Like that was like my thing. And it totally helped with my handle because there's times where I was high and I had to go low, drew between people. You can go low to high or whatever. Um, that was just an amazing time for me, just learning that basketball stuff and then watching like, you know, my, yeah. my, my mentors. Um, another guy would be, wow. I'm going to have to say Pearl Washington because of his moves. Okay. I remember Pearl shook a guy in college, dropped him, and the dude fell in front of him. Pearl jumped over him. <laughs> like, so he didn't stop the play. Yeah. Hit him, pop, pop, pop. He dropped Pearl, whoop, and kept going, pushing the brake. He was the in and out cross, the hezzy. He was the he's the real hezzy god. I know they got a guy who got that nickname, but the, that's not you. <laughs> Pearl Washington is the guy that hit you with, the, uh, yeah. Uh, and it was just, but you have to understand why he was hesitating. He was hesitating because he would want to read what you did defensively. What did you do? If I if I hit you here and I stop, I want to see what your footwork looks like. So I'm looking at your feet. Oh, oh, you step. Oh, or oh, you oh you back up. Okay. Wow. Yep. So. For me, that's that's three, and then number four. Wow, um, I'm I'm probably gonna mess you up a little bit with this one because you, I can give you a thousand guesses, and you, and he's on he's on the wall. MJ, Michael Jordan. Hmm. You have to think about the fact that Michael Jordan got anywhere on the floor he wanted to anytime he wanted to. That's true. So when we talk about ball handling, is it fanciness or ability to get any spot on the floor I want to whenever I want to? Now I got to figure out how to make the shot. So he was able to do that. Yeah. Think about it. He's two I'm dribble. Cre- you're not going to credit that to his athleticism though? Um, no, because I watched him dribble the ball before. There's an there's a old um, photo shoot he did one time. And he's just dribbling the ball, just sitting there, just dribbling the ball. His fundamentals are amazing. He was perfect fundamentally. Perfect. He had a post game. 
big hands, and he could literally handle the ball. You know, so they were talking about how oh, he couldn't go left. For what? <laughs> you can't <laughs> stop me going right. Right. But most ball players can't go left past two dribbles. Think about that. Mm-hmm. Most ball players, especially young, they got two dribbles with their left, and they got to go back to the right. Mike could go. His two dribbles going left was at the rim. Yeah. And then when he just three years in, he can go left, right, middle, behind, back. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I look at ball handling as being able to get to any spot you want to, anytime you want to. Um, like, uh, of course, I could have made it easy and put Allen Iverson, one of those guys in there, but I have to look at it from a scoring aspect of just wherever I want to go, I can go. Yeah, I could even put Kobe in that situation because I think Kobe, from a style standpoint, was better than Jordan, but Mike got to any spot he wanted to, and that's very unappreciated. The fact that he, how did he get there? Yeah, he's quick, he's fast, but there's a lot of quick, a lot of fast dudes, but they don't do it as, they don't do it as good as him. They don't do it as efficient Efficient, as Mike. So efficiency, the ability to go. So being able to drill from the top of the key and get to the rim, you still have to get by that first guy. You know, right. when he dribbled out and then spun back on the baseline and dunked on Pastor Jewel, and that's a that's a movement. That's a whole mm. the control it took to go from here to spin back there. That's yeah. handle. Yep. So that's my four. Absolutely. Yeah. So my four, I got two the same, two different. Mm-hmm. Okay. I have Kyrie, of mm-hmm. course. Just like you said, his ability to read or the drop of a dime and the footwork that he has to go with ball placement. I think his the biggest part of ball his thing is the ball placement on his dribble when he picks it up on his layups and he he has mastered the art of ball placement. Mm-hmm. And so uh, Kyrie for sure. From and, a shooting and a dribbling standpoint, people yes. don't understand ball placement when dribbling, like dribbling the ball up the court, the ball should never be on your hip. Nope, it should always be in front of you so as you dribble, you can step into it. Every yes. dribble, you can step into it. Guys dribble on their hip, I can just tap it, push you, and go back and get the ball. In the same way in the half court, when I'm trying to get to my pull-up jumper, that ball needs to be yep. so you can pick it up, right? Yes. And then, so, Isaiah, just like you said, I mean, I, I watch Isaiah post-Isaiah because I was too young to really, you know, enjoy the time when he was in the league, but his ability to do whatever you want with the ball and get to places at his size. And then I'm going to have put Jamal Crawford. Mm. Jamal Crawford, his creativity, he never trained. <laughs> he just hooped. He worked on his, he just, he yeah. just, he felt the game. He yeah. flowed with the game. He's and a natural. So the moves that he created, some I feel like he created, you know, the behind the back with the uh, pro hop, behind yeah. pro hop, um, you know, hit the double behind the back that Curry does now. Like, mm-hmm. man, that's Jamal Crawford stuff. Yeah. And um, just the feel of the game, natural ball handler for sure. And then, the last one, it was up in the air, okay? So I'm, I'm, I am, I'm stuck between an AI. I actually have Steve Nash in there. Steve mm, Nash is a sleeper. To fundamentals. Me. Man, he, but he goes along with my Michael Jordan then. I know he's not my, he's not my four, though. I'm just arguably in my So you're four. balancing between those two? No. Who you got? No. My, my last one. <laughs> Let me get there. Let me get there. <laughs> so my other one is Magic Johnson. Mm, at 6'9", be able to handle the ball like that. And ball handling has to do with your passing. And so he can, the way he controlled the basketball at that He got size. the ball to a, to, to a pocket. He always get the ball to a pocket where he can pass the ball yeah. through. Just so he'd always get it to here and make and he can make whatever pass. Yep, yep. And then it just, again, creativity with it and um, doing it at 6'9", you know, that's, that's And people wild. think, like, People don't understand he was he was fast. Man. They got up the floor fast. It was what? a fast break. He didn't walk it up the ball. He, I mean, walk up the floor. He, he was pushing the ball. Pushing the ball. Two time. dribbles, three dribbles. He give you all that. And his you vision, know. his vision is great. We, that's a whole nother mountain mm-hmm. talking about vision. So yeah, but no, that's my four, man. That's, a, that's an awesome floor. I think, hey, young fellas, go study those people. Like that's that's what the simplicity is about. of Jordan, the simplicity and efficiency of Jordan, for me. With Magic, his ability to handle the ball and and just push it. One of the things NBA scouts have told me over the past decade is they look at kids who make decisions quickly. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's what they want to see. They want to see a kid not walk the ball up the court. They want to see a kid that can get the ball and 
push it up the court. If the defense don't stop them, they don't stop. If the defense stops them, then they Man. make simple reads. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Can you push the ball up the court and make simple, quick reads, quick decisions? Because the NBA game is so fast because these are the best athletes in the world. And I made a quote the other day. Well, I've been saying it for a while. But my thing is, I don't think it's the best basketball players that make it. I think it's the best athletes that play basketball well that make it. Mm -hmm. Because everybody in the NBA is crazy athletic. They're 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 fast and quick. Yeah. And have long arms. You got guys with six. You got point guards with six ten wingspan. You know, so you you're not just dealing with a good basketball player. You're dealing with somebody who can just walk in a gym cold and do a three sixty like no right. problem. Go between the legs. Darrell Wright was a baseball player. Until he didn't start playing basketball seriously until his junior year in high school. And that's why he was a shooter because of the hand-eye coordination. Because he was Crazy. throwing that baseball. People who play baseball and were quarterbacks in football are always really good shooters. Mm, they know how to control Because of the hand-eye coordination. Wow. Um, so, next part is where were you when? So, a moment in basketball history that was impactful to your life and that you were a part of. Mm -hmm. So, what was that moment? Um, Michael Jordan... Doing the Rock the Cradle dunk in Madison Square Garden mm. preseason, 84. And then watching... You were, you were there? I was there. Mm. I was there. Watched that. And then I came back when they played... Um, when he played his first game in the Garden. And the crazy thing about that Chicago Bulls team was their layup line. That was like a show within itself. So they had... Um, so Orlando Woods would go first, and you know, you know, um, you know, God bless him. Uh, crazy six eight six nine leaper, powerful dunker, crazy. Then Jordan would go, and he would just jump, and he would jump so quick, and he'd get up so high and float, and just powerful with it as well. And then Wes Matthews, mm. six foot one little dude, would get up there and damn near out dunk all two of them, the two guys <laughs> in front of him. So that was crazy. But then to see. Michael Jordan's quickness live. So back, you know, back in the days, you know, it wasn't a big thing to, to you know, you buy a ticket and you just walk down. You know, <laughs> it wasn't a big deal. You do that now, they lock you up. Right. So me as a as a teenager, you know, I bought my ticket. I don't know where my ticket was. I just, as soon as I got there, I looked to see, you know, where a good seat was, the closest <laughs> seat. I got right under the basket. Um, of the Bulls when they're doing layup line and I'm watching Jordan and I'm watching when the game starts how quick he was how fast he was and remember I told you I thought NBA players were like magical people yeah. I, I didn't believe how quick he I, it's, it didn't make sense so people think oh guys just let him do that no 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 no, no. He moved faster than everyone. But mind you, I was a, a Jordan fan of his in college. I watched him in college. I used to watch um, a guy, an older guy named Al McGuire, who was announcer back then on NBC Sports. He used to do the, the, the North Carolina games. And Jordan had a different swagger. He had swagger. Swagger wasn't a thing that everybody had. People were just kind of, you know, cookie cutter back in the days in college. Mm -hmm. He had swagger. He would walk with a bop. You know what I'm saying? He would chew on gum, you know. He came up with the wristband one sophomore year. Um, it had the ball head sophomore year. I was like, yo, he's different. And then he was dunking on people. He Big hands. He would post up. I saw him do something I'd never seen another human being do. The ball was taken out of half court. He's standing at the three-point line. And he's, he's on the, the ball taken on the sideline at half court. So probably slid up a little bit. Kenny Smith inbounded. He threw the ball up. So Jordan's just standing there, and the guy's face guarding him right here. Dude, just threw the ball straight up. Jordan jumped straight up in the air, caught the ball, and kept going up with it and took a jump shot and made it. That's <laughs> he, he alley -ooped a jump shot. alley -ooped a jump shot. I never thought about that, but you're right. He alley -ooped a jump shot on an inbounds play. <laughs> the most amazing thing i ever this seen. This is at North Carolina. Life. He was at Carolina. Oh, we got to find that. Yeah, I promise you, I would not even make that up. It doesn't even make sense to make that up. But being there, the, I think the biggest moment for me was 1986, first game of the season, Knicks versus Bulls, and he scored 50. But during that game, 
um, he was doing the kiss the rim dunk where he would jump and just lean and he was like sideways. It looked I, I couldn't I couldn't get down to the floor because by that time everybody knew who Air Jordan was. Right. This was like you know third year in or whatever, and I was way up there and it looked like he was laying out flat in the air, and I was like, nah, he's not from this world. He's an alien. Space Jam. This, yeah, it made <laughs> sense. So for me, watching him score 50 first game of the season, watch him do the rock the cradle dunk against the Knicks in preseason, like those. Those were, those were iconic moments in his career, and people still don't really understand like why I picked Jordan over like everyone. I'm like I saw it, but I also have perspective because I saw LeBron. You know, I also have perspective because I saw Dr. J. Mm, yeah. You know, um, I saw a little bit of David Thompson. I saw Clyde Drexler. I saw Kobe. I saw these guys up close and personal. Mm -hmm. So when I look and I think about the impact that Jordan made on my life from a basketball player to a, from a highlight player to this dude took off from the free throw line and <laughs> pumped it and then spread eagle and dunked it and still could have took off from further. Because right. he dunked it like this. He didn't Kept get full still extension. Going up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like that right there is, I mean, they, inter they really introduced slow motion into the dunk contest because of like Jordan and Dominique, the, the poetry. Yeah. You know? Um, so one last thing about the dunking. So I had a, um, a mentor that was out here. Um, his name was Jason Works. He was the most amazing basketball player I've ever seen in my life. He was five foot nine and he was like a beach bum. Mm. He was a basketball player. He lived in Baldwin Hills. Family was well off, whatever, doctors, whatever. So all he did was play basketball. He was older than me. He was, you know. But he might have had a 50 inch vertical. Like, I would see this guy shoot jumpers from half court, just jump up in the air. He'd be yelling, ah, oh, swish, ah, oh, just shooting. Like, he was legendary in the LA area. People in LA, who, they're going to know about him. Jason Works, he was amazing. And. He taught me one of my biggest lessons about basketball, about being prepared. He was like, yo, you want to play one-on-one? -on -one? I was like, I was cocky, too. I was like 18. <laughs> I was nice. I'm like, you? You're not doing me what you do to them dudes. I'm from, I'm fresh out of New York City. He said, you think you good? I said, Psh. He was like, I'll play your game to 25. Going by once. Back then, we played real games. We didn't go to seven. Right. 12. <laughs> you mean it's an ones hour and game. twos. No, it's one. <laughs> he said, if you even touch the basketball, you win. I want to fight him at that point. Because I felt disrespectful. That's disrespectful. <laughs> I said, what you mean touch? Like you miss and I get the ball? He said, no. If you can even touch the basketball while I'm dribbling, you win. I'm going to destroy you. I want to fight him. <laughs> Did you touch the basketball? 15 minutes later, it was 25 <laughs> zip. <laughs> And I was like, teach me, please. Uh, so so oh he ended gosh. up like training me, you know. Um, and there's a bunch of guys that I came up with that know. One of my guys' name is Jason Martin. Jay Martin, so he lives out here or whatever. Yeah. He got trained by, by um, Jay Works too. Um, he passed him years ago, a few years ago or whatever. But he's like the most incredible basketball player ever. And he would like, he would play you in flip-flops. He'd have like three, four pairs yeah. of socks on, have flip flops on, and play you one on one, and dunk on you, and cook you. in flip flops. And people think I make this stuff up, I'm like, nah, you have to see it for yourself. Like, there are some incredible ball players that yeah. we've nowadays. You know, you can't hide that talent. This right. video, there, somebody's gonna, hey, you want to try out? You know, just behave yourself. Yeah. And we'll pay you can you. see some of the people who dunk now that are the professional dunkers. Like, how are you even able they to have do no something? game? Right, but they could just they can just jump like lie. like yeah. Jesus. <laughs> so yeah, um, so this is the part where we flip the script. Oh well, usually I usually talk about that moment, but I wasn't born yet, so I love Michael Jordan though. Um, <laughs> but uh, flip the script. Two questions for me about anything. Who's the best high school basketball player you ever saw live? Honestly, yeah, Sky Clark, sophomore year. I will 
Take oh, it yeah, yeah, now. yeah. Sky, I, 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 I was watching those videos. Yeah, y'all yeah, sent me all those videos. His sophomore year, was crazy. Man, I tell people all it was the a time. Movie. In high school, sophomore year, he shot 50-something percent from the field and was just cooking everybody, man. I I seen him single-handedly take this team. We had a talented team. We had seven Division One players on the team at the time. And we were in the first round, second round of playoffs. We went down to Orange County. There was no count. In this generation, with Sky Clark, I want you to understand this, Sky Clark had no cameras at this game. Oh, wow. And then we forgot the iPad that we normally record the game with as coaches. Mm -hmm. It was because it was deep in Orange County, like mm -hmm. deep. Um, and nobody else can get going. This man dropped 49. And one no like normal 49. Mm -hmm. It was a 49 of... Kenny told me about that game, too. NBA 3. It's crazy because... I know there was no footage. Damn, there's no footage of it. When when literally Netflix was following Sky around that year, they yeah. weren't there at that game for whatever reason. And uh, that season, man, go watch that sophomore mixtape, man. Oh, and, no, and so I, in person for me, yeah. and I've seen LeBron play in high school. I've seen Se Sebastian Telfair comes very close. I saw Sebastian Telfair play in high school. He was wild. Um, because I got to see every single one of Sky's games that year. Um, man, it was just, it was crazy the things that the kid was able to do and to... Uh, you know, witness his growth in that time. So yeah. that's because once he me. left you, he was in um, Tennessee. He was in Tennessee, and I would go and work him out, and um, he used to be mad at me because I'm like, I'm not, I'm not, you're not doing all that dribbling. I want you to simplify it, <laughs> you know. And he got to that point, and his first game, junior year, he scored 51. He had 38 at halftime. Mm. And a coach said, stop shooting. Why? Because he's at a private school and... Oh, like sports The ministry. pressure... No, the pressure from parents was like, this kid just got here and you let him do all this. But he was shooting 80% from the field. He probably wrong. shot 85% in the first half. He missed maybe two shots or less. Maybe. <laughs> I was like... it was He had 38 at halftime. Man. And I was like, oh, he's going for 70. Yeah. And then he wasn't sure. I was like, well, shoot the ball. What are you doing? Show that. You know, but you could tell the pressure had gotten to the coach or whatever. So, yeah, I knew at that time he, he, he has talent. Yeah. And he's still absorbing talent. So there's mm -hmm. there's no. And then he's with my, he's with my OG Kenny Payne in Kentucky now. So, I mean, excuse Louisville. me, at Louisville. Mm -hmm. So there's no telling where. You know, they'll be able to take him. I know I talked to Kenny a few weeks ago, and he said that he's testing through the roof. So this should be a big year for Louisville, a yeah. big year for him. Hopefully he can recreate that magic because I think um, as an elite ball player, once you're able to play the game from a lower level at the upper level, so if you can take your high school game and play like that in college, it's like, whoa. Yeah. But then if you take your college game and, and play that in the NBA, it's like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's why you're there. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. No, so there you go. Sky Clark. Hmm. Okay, so, hmm. Which one is your favorite movie? And why? Whew. Man, so many ones. I don't know how you got cornbread early. Me, you weren't even born yet. My mama put me movie. on. Mama put you they on. They killed cornbread. Man, they want it. They, <laughs> they running in slow motion. Yep. Um, the fish that say privilege was crazy. Yeah. Man, this is really really tough. I I think it's Sunset Park. I don't know why I was gonna say my man Talent is in that movie. It's crazy. I brought Talent to uh, do a comedy show at my. When I was at Georgia College in Millersville, he's crazy. Yeah. No, I think Sunset Park. If I could watch any basketball movie on repeat over and over. And it's tough because Above the Rim is right there. Coach Carter's really up there. Loving Basketball was up there. But Sunset Park, because um, it had the hip hop fully injected. So did Above the Rim, but it was like high school kids. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> just the, you know, the comedy factor of it. A young Terrence Howard, a spaceman, was hilarious. And there's some unforgettable quotes. Oh, wow. I forgot about that. Yeah. He was a crazy Dude, they kid. was in there running, yes. uh, doing the uh, wall sits, and he's counting, nine, eight, 
seven yeah. and then look he's on his not face. even featured on the poster <laughs> nah. like those guys were above him and now he's way above all of them that's crazy yep and so it, and there's so many quotes in that movie that me and my friends took and said throughout my childhood mm. and, and things i'm not gonna say on the camera but it's a uh, man sunset park is is one of them ones and i, I kind of like sleeper stuff like I like to find sleepers on the basketball court. It's a sleeper film to me. I don't think not every not every hooper seen Sunset Park. Every hooper seen Above the Rim and White Man Can't Jump though, you know. And so Sunset Park. Most people haven't seen Fighting Forest, right? And that's the one. Sean Connery, man. It was it's man. Sean Connery, like yeah. gems forever. Yeah, yeah. Now these every movie up here, man, has impacted me. And you know, and when you're young, you want to find that love in basketball. You wanted you wanted to have the the game like uh you know an above the rim like Kyle Kyle Watson, and you know you start spreading your fingers on your jump shot like you're supposed to after mm-hmm. <laughs> after the advice. The air up there was crazy <laughs> to me. The air up there was so <laughs> was so crazy. But it happens now. Like that's yeah that's, now that's it's a, a thing. Real thing. It's a real thing. Yeah. It's a real thing. So. Yeah, I think people sleep on Eddie, which is a funny movie. A lot of NBA stars yes. in that movie. One of the first ones that had like a lot of NBA dudes. And so, yeah, nah, I think all the all the hoop movies is nice. So, yeah, yeah, all those movies made money. Yeah. Um, so, got twenty four second shot clock. That's your camera right there. Let the people know anything you want them to know. Um, anything that you want them to, uh, anything new you have going on, you want them to know about, or just talk to the people and let them know your heart. Um, I don't know. This is this is not <laughs> much to know. I love basketball. It's, it's um, it's it's uh, it's not a, it's not a job. It's it's a dream come true to be able to play in this space, work in this space, and I think parents uh, take advantage of these opportunities for these kids to get an amazing education and experience rather than think about it as my kid's going to go pro. And that's one of the biggest issues is that every kid that goes Division One, you're potentially not going to be a pro, but open up your kid's eyes and talk to the school about how they can help connect them with alumni. Like every kid should be doing an internship in the summertime. If you're not a guaranteed pro, one and done or whatever, you could still find time to do an internship because once you finish that internship every year, now think about it, you got three years you can do internships. Once you graduate, you have the possibility of working for one of those companies. And within that internship, you're learning not necessarily the job itself, but you're learning how to um, handle yourself in corporate America, how to deal with um, decision making, how to dress, how you should deal with um, certain situations or whatever, you know, how to get coffee, how to be on time. I'll be early. If you yeah. on time, you're late. You know, certain things in, in corporate America that those are values that you need to have before you even step step foot into those those situations. So I just think from a parent from a parental standpoint, try to make sure that your child is not just there to play basketball, that there are other things that they can take from these situations because the coaches, they're definitely taking from you. A basketball scholarship is not necessarily a free education. It's not because there are classes that you cannot take. Like as a basketball player, it's very rare that you see a basketball player turn into a doctor because a lot of those classes aren't available because they're available when you have games. Yep. Those biology classes are at nighttime. You know what I'm saying? So you don't have that guaranteed free education that everybody else does. So figure out a way to use the system and not let the system use you. So. I'm going to turn this to the two-minute drill. Nobody has got it in 24 seconds since we started this. Yeah. <laughs> so awesome. it's all good, though, because it's great information. Mark, pleasure having you on the show, brother. Yeah. Appreciate you. you. Me. We'll see you guys next time. Peace.